Good day, everyone. Welcome to Gaia STEM lecture series of Taiwan Top Science Student Project. I'm today's host, Julian Chi from National Central University, Taiwan. It's my best honor to introduce our speaker today, Professor Li Xiaozhang, Jonathan B. Postel, Professor of Computer Science in Samuel Lee School of Engineering, UCLA. Professor Li Xiaozhang started her internet research in 1981 when she started her PhD study at MIT, in which month the TCPIP specifications were published. She joined the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center upon graduation and spent seven exciting years there because during that time, the internet went from an obscure research to its initial rollout in a global scale. When Professor Zhang was recruited to UCLA Computer Science Department, her original plan was to move on to something new once she's got a taste of teaching. But that did not happen because Professor, Professor Zhang said she has found it to be too much fun working with brilliant students and inventing the future together. So she said her mission is to help the internet grow. Professor Zhang was an Internet Hall of Fame member of the Internet Society in 2021. She has got the Lifetime Achievement Award for work on computer networks of the Association of Computing Machinery. She was an ASEAN Fellow, an IEEE Fellow, and has won IEEE Internet Award. Her research emphasis now is the cybersecurity and future internet, internet architecture and protocol design, security in large scale and open system and named data networking. So now today, Professor Zhang is going to take us onto a journey of evolving the internet into the future via named data. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Zhang to talk about her research and works. Professor Zhang and Li Jian, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, that I feel this kind of I'm really honored to give this talk. I want to tell everyone that you can do better than me. And I have done some work purely because of uh, good luck. As the professor uh, she just uh, mentioned, I happened to uh, land at the right place, which was MIT at the right time when uh, TCPIP the core protocol of the internet uh, just got introduced. But uh, like I said, everyone can do better. And here I want to share with you uh, my understanding of how to design the network architecture. Uh, I saw in the email that th this uh, seminar is attended by uh, students and other faculty members with a very wide uh, diversity of background. So I prepared a, a, a deck of slides and, and then depend on how fast we go, uh, I may or may not finish all. But uh, I really want people to pick up uh, the basic uh, points I want to make that I hope everyone get it. That is, uh, network architecture design is really like a scientific endeavor. So therefore, if we know how to do uh, science, then uh, we know how to design the network architecture. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, if I figure out how to share, share the. So let's get started with this. Uh, I hope I can explain the network architecture design in a comprehensive way that uh, everyone here can both get the basic idea as well as not getting bored because hopefully I'm seeing something you probably have not heard from others before. So let's get started um, talking about effects and artifacts. Uh, internet is such a prevalence uh, services today, especially for the young students. You were born with uh, the internet available. So therefore, you might think that the internet and all the great applications are the part of a life as ever. I want to tell you that uh, actually, 
uh, that is not. At the time I walked to MIT from my PhD training, internet wasn't there yet. Because as the professor she mentioned, I went there during the month, the TCP IP specification just got published. The actual rollout that is deploying the TCP IP protocol happened in January 1983. Uh, so, so networking, and this is just the, the same as all the other computer systems. They are the artifacts, not the facts. So what are the facts? Facts are the given world uh, built by the nature. Oh, you know, someone with the religions will see that built by the God. Nevertheless, the shared thing is that as a given. So therefore, as a scientist, as the oldest scientific discipline, uh, physicists really study the ingredients of the nature, uh, how they behave, and identify the underlying physical laws. How they do it? They make a hypothesis, then they do test and measurement and analysis, draw conclusions, then they go back to uh, revise their hypothesis based on the conclusions uh, they just got. You know, if the original hypothesis was incorrect, then they have to make a new one. If the original hypothesis was inaccurate, then they will enhance it. For example, gravity, uh, was invented by Newton, but uh, the relativity uh, by Einstein, you know, really extended the laws of nature to a microscopic uh, world. So that's how the physics, the real science works. But the uh, computer systems uh, with the internet as uh, like the biggest uh, system that the human has ever built, uh, they are artifacts. Uh, but uh, I want to say that artifacts are also facts once they got built. So therefore, uh, they can be studied just like uh, we study the physical world. Uh, what is our hypothesis? We do the design. The design is based on the given conditions and the given assumptions. That's equivalent to uh, the physicists that making hypotheses about uh, the physical world. We build the systems, then we do measurement analysis and draw conclusions about the design, whether it's a good one or bad one, then we go back to the uh, design board uh, to revise the design or design a new system for that. So what I'm trying to convince you is that we call ourselves computer scientists. We are scientists. Uh, the only difference between us and the physicist is what we study. We study artifacts and the physicist study, study the, the real physical world. I'd like to say that please feel free to uh, bring up questions. I got my screen um, filled in by the slides, so I cannot see uh, if anyone send a chat message asking questions. I hope that the moderator will just bring the question to my attention. I'd very sure. much like, yeah, thank you. I'd very much like this talk to be more interactive, uh, in which every party benefits. I will benefit from your questions to see where I didn't explain clearly, and you benefit, of course, uh, with a better understanding of what I'm trying to explain. Now. <laughs> Although we say we computer scientists or us as a scientist, as a physicist, but I want to point it out that there's one fundamental difference uh, because the physical world does not change over time, not in the time scale of human life. Uh, Newton's law is still Newton's law. It still holds true. Einstein merely made modifications uh, at a different scope. But uh, the artifact world that's change. Like uh, over the 40 years I have been working on networking, the world has changed in very fundamental ways. At the time I started at MIT, computers were the giants that take a huge room uh, and with the, the air conditionings and everything. How we access uh, the computers, 
there is a cable connecting to offices uh, with the terminals. And so you access the computer through the remote uh, terminal connection. But look at it today. I hope that everyone uh, has a smartphones. And those phones are actually as capable, I believe, as those giant computers uh, I used back in 1981. So artifact world changes. And therefore, uh, when we go through the cycles of designing, measuring, then drawing conclusions of the current design, uh, when we go back to the design table, the world has changed. And very much likely the technology at the next design cycle would be drastically different from the previous one. What that means is that there's no design as perfect. As the technology changes, you always want to take the most advantage of the latest technology uh, to build the systems that meet the user's ever increasing demands uh, to computer systems in general and to the network in particular. Now, how do we do this design? Um, there is a hurdle uh, that is not like a physical world that was given. We don't criticize this was done correct or incorrect. We merely can only study it. But for the computer networks, we design it. So there is an open question, how we do it? How we do it? Well, we through the cycles based on the technology available at the time. And we try, try our best, I guess, to say, here's the right design. Uh, through implementation and usage, we figure out whether the design is right. And then uh, we move on to the next cycle most likely the technology has changed. So we use the network design as an illustration to explain uh, these repeated cycles of design, measuring, experimentation, draw conclusions, and we do the next design. And as a technology advances, so if we use the network design as an illustration, we can see that uh, the network architecture has changed uh, fundamentally. The very first communication network uh, is the telephone networks. Uh, I don't know how many people here are old enough that have ever used the, the dial-up telephones. Uh, the, the rotating um, device, you have to dial the numbers and uh, get the other and pick up a phone to have a conversation. Uh, this, this current generation, we live with the internet, with the phone call. That's the same thing as any other apps on your phone. That you merely just enter a number. Uh, as a matter of fact, you have a, a directory service. You don't really enter the number. You look up your directory and figure out the name you want to call. But internet offered so many different other applications beyond calls. I don't think many people are still doing calls as much. Uh, as in the older days, where the communication could only be done through the phone calls. Now, if we buy the religion, or the belief, I should say, that technology continues to advance, therefore the design also needs to advance, just like we moved from the telephone network to today's internet. Now, what will be the next design? So we have this... Uh, one proposal, one for the multiple proposals, perhaps on the table. And I will give you a, uh, just a rough idea how this new thing called named the data networking uh, looks like at a very high level. Uh, to learn the details, which I very much like to uh, ex explain to you, would need uh, additional uh, time to explain. But uh, like everything else, uh, although the communication designs are very different, but they must answer the same two questions because the network is about communications. And therefore, you must have a way to identify whom you communicate with or what you want to communicate about. So there is an identifier space design. I will explain to you how the different designs 
uh, answer that question. The second thing is about the means of communication. Uh, by this, I don't mean to say whether you use a satellite as a means or use a Wi-Fi as a means, but rather I meant to say how the communication get conducted. For example, in the older days, when we do telephone calls, uh, the system actually set up a circuit that's uh, literally a physical circuit from the caller to the callee so that your voice can get through the circuit. Uh, and the internet works in a different way, I'm going to explain shortly. And then I talk about the future design that works yet in another fundamentally different way. So for each of the design, I'm just to try to explain how each answers these two questions. What is their identifier space used to communicate and how they communicate? Uh, so let's look at the, the first one, uh, the telephone network. It's invented that many years back. Um, that you see, before the telephone network, human being didn't have a way to do long distance communications uh, beyond the site. Uh, how the telephone was made available, that, that's due to technology advances, so that, you know, Bell figured out how to convert a voice into electrical signals and then propagate that signal through the circuits. Uh, so that you can see there's a two phones uh, that can call each other. But uh, nobody can build a circuit if, between any pairs of the phone site. Therefore, you have the switching board uh, to start with. Uh, with, with the human beings plugged in the numbers, you know, the colors connecting to the colleagues. And later, uh, people invented the automatic switch to build a network. So for the telephone networks, uh, the answer to the two questions, how they communicate, they literally set up a, a physical circuit. And then uh, so those the switch the networks, and then the identifier space is telephone numbers. So for telephone numbers, you can think that, oh, this is the same number I use today. Like in US, it's uh, uh, the nine digits, and the internationally, I think, a 10 plus or some digits, right? That's still the phone numbers. But uh, that's for today's phone calls, that's only the surface. The, actually, your voice wasn't dependent on those numbers. The numbers merely become identifier uh, for who you're calling, but the network does not use your phone number to make the call. Why? Because we no longer do phones, phone networks anymore. All your voices today actually carry this through the internet. That is uh, by this uh, new protocol, uh, IP internet protocol that was designed back in 1981, like a Professor she mentioned earlier, um, September 1981, the specification was published and then uh, the internet got built. How the internet got built? Technology advances. Uh, because in the 60s, the, tele the computers became available uh, so that those switches in the internet actually are made of uh, computers and they can do way more, they can provide way more functionalities than the old way the circuit switches. Um, so therefore, we built uh, the internet. How does the internet are different from the telephone networks? So you can see that uh, for the telephone networks, you know, you you have the circuit switch. You switch from uh, you set up the circuit from a caller to the callee. How does the network know which way the circuit should be built? That pass from the a specific caller to a specific callee identified by the phone number, that pass was pre-computed offline and just uploaded, uploaded to those uh, switching uh, devices. So therefore the switching devices didn't have a, to have any intelligence. It just based on the numbers that trigger the signals making you know one switch connecting to a different, different pass 
and get your phone call through. But uh, with the computers, uh, the switches, uh, we do far more fancy stuff. Why is that? We don't really set up a circuit. Instead, we encode the voices into individuals, I call the bags of bits. Uh, you encode the voice into some bytes, the bits, and then you package, package them up, just like uh, your parcel. Uh, then you, you throw out to the network, and the network will deliver it, along which paths. Uh, this is a fundamental difference between the internet and the phone systems. Uh, the path is selected dynamically based on the conditions of the network. Maybe some nodes get overloaded, some nodes get failed, or the link failed. So the IP, because it runs on computers, they can pick the working path or pick the best path, the shortest path, to uh, uh, get the, the so-called packets from the source to the destination. So therefore, packet switching fundamentally differs from circuit switch in, in this way. That is, although it is still from one node to another node uh, delivering the data, but it decouples the source to destination delivery from the specific path the, the data must go through. Rather, the path is changed, can change it dynamically. Uh, making the internet to become a, a robust uh, against the failures. So where uh, came out this idea, dynamic routing? Uh, it's enabled by computers, but somebody has to figure out a way to use computers to have this invention. And uh, you know, one of the pioneers of circuit, uh, packet switching is Paul Barron, and uh, here is a paper uh, he wrote in early 60s, now come to think about it, it's about 60 years back. He came up with this idea to say, hey, we can build the communication systems in a totally different way than what we were, we were doing at the time, that is the circuit switch. Uh, for inventions, I'm very sure everyone here wants to have their own invention, do something totally different and then uh, innovative and new so that you know, make an impact uh, in the real world. There is a secret question that is, how do you get that, that idea that actually can work? That's a hard question to answer. But uh, you can look at the, in the past, who got the idea and how this person succeeded to get some hints um, to uh, figure out where your new, new invention idea may come from. Like I quoted uh, the Churchill said, the father backward you can look, the father forward uh, you can see. Uh, I think that's a really uh, great uh, suggestion. So how did the Baron uh, got this packet switching design idea right? I, I summarized it into two uh, points. One side, you have to think differently. Because uh, at the time, the only existing network is a telephone network. Uh, so therefore, people working on communications thought the telephone network uh, would be the only way to build the communication systems. And Paul Barron, by the way, he's also a UCLA graduate. Uh, we are so proud of him. Uh, he actually think very differently. He saw the arrival of computers and therefore uh, imagined a future all digital data distributed networks. And therefore, we can get rid of uh, the circuits by communicating using packets. And this directly relates to the next uh, point. How can you do something so differently? That is because uh, Paul Barron realized that computers have become available and therefore you can utilize the latest technology to do things in a different way. So I put here um, the source of the quotations. That's a paper Paul Barron wrote in 1977, where he talked about the past, present, and the future uh, of the networks. This is not a very technical paper, but you know, look at the design. 
approaches from uh, the high level. I think everyone here would enjoy reading that short paper. So packet switch is an idea to say, now we can communicate fundamentally differently because we can use computers as switches. But that is still requires a specific design. If you say, you know, computers just uh, shoot out bags of bits we call packets, uh, what's the format for that? And, and how you indicate where the destination is, things like that. So we call this as a, a protocol architecture. And you can read the two RFCs, that is the internet way of uh, uh, publishing standards. Uh, you can see that it's really back in 1981 that got published. So I can, I, I suggest people take a look, uh, but just for now, give you the rough idea, what is the RFC size? Just look at this picture. This is from the RFC 791 Internet Protocol Specification, that is the IP specification. Uh, this design carries everyone's data around, including our uh, conference today. Like my voice, my slides, all carried in IP packets. But what is the basic idea? Uh, you say called an architecture. Architecture means that there's different pieces. You have to interconnect them together. Uh, so, my uh, friend Steve Deering, D E E R I N G, um, he is uh, you know one of the pioneers in the internet. So he started to convert those uh, this ASCII drawing on the right to the left uh, nicer drawing as an hourglass. So this is a so-called protocol stack uh, architecture, and the IP is the centerpiece because that carries the, the data from any computers to any other computers on the, connected to the internet. Uh, and here, I just want to point out, IP really plays the critical uh, role here. Applications, there are different applications that have different desires. Someone, some apps want reliable delivery, other apps can tolerate uh, not so reliable delivery, like for it's example, five thirty. Sorry, uh, like voice doesn't have to be so reliable, but the other things must be reliable. So there's other adaptations to make the application happen. Happy, that's a transport. Uh, but the IP is really the critical part of delivering data. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, as a, such a successful protocol, the design actually pretty simple. Uh, the you have to get the big picture right. So what the IP assumed is that there is an interconnected network. We call it a, it's a communication infrastructure. That is, it's not a mobile. It's not a ad hoc. It's not a delay tolerant or disruption tolerant. That is, maybe um, some portion got disconnected. That was not the assumption of IP. Instead, IP assumed there is a connected infrastructure, then there's lots of uh, computers attached to it. The most important part in the IP design is the source address and destination address. That really determines how packet can be delivered to, uh, to the desired place. Uh, so I said, all networks must answer two questions. You know, what is your uh, identifier space? And then how, what is the means of communication? For the first question, uh, IP address, you can think it's pretty much the same as the telephone uh, numbers. It identifies the destination nodes. But uh, it's also different from telephone numbers. That is, it, is not, it doesn't use telephone numbers. Instead, IP design decided, hey, we're going to make our own number in space. That's called IP addresses. Why I put the important up front? because this makes the IP addresses totally independent from the telephone numbers. It doesn't matter whether you can carry IP over the telephone network or over some other communication media, like at the time you know, the ethernet uh, and others like satellite networks, uh, wireless networks, uh, things like that. So I want to make a point for the identifier space. If you do a new design, get your own identifier space that's totally independent from the existing system identifier space. 
Uh, so in, in terms of identifier space, it's the same or different. The same is that what you identify, you still identify the nodes. What's it different is that you don't, you totally decouple from the previous numbering space. Now, the means of communication, you deliver the packets to addresses uh, so that you don't really have to nail down the paths like the telephone network does, but the computers in, inside of the network, now we call the routers, they are smart enough to figure out in real time what is the best way to forward the packets toward the destination. Uh, that's really the great advantages so that we no longer have to set up circuits before we can send data. Now, think about IP is a totally different design from telephone. At the time, there's a question, how you can get a new, new network rolled out, given the, the world had already had the telephone network for communication. So how did the IP got out? Uh, it's a promising new direction, uh, new technology using packet switch. Uh, uh, but at the time, back in 1981, or even at the 1983, when the TCP IP got deployed, uh, it's really within a very small research community. Um, and and uh, the outside people back in 1981 didn't know there's such a thing called the internet. Now, how did the world get to learn? IP enabled the new applications that the telephone doesn't support. Telephone networks support phone calls, but they don't support uh, email. At the time, that was the very first uh, popular application that everyone wants. We still use email today. Uh, so that's really useful uh, then. And many people want to run emails. As a matter of fact, people will install TCP IP on their computers so they can send email. Uh, this larger deployment is really kind of a larger scale experimentation based on what I said earlier, that you design the system, you deploy it, it's really you're running the experimentation, see how well it works. Yeah. And uh, during the time of this larger scale experimentation, we realized there the missing pieces in the original design, like the domain name system that got deployed uh, actually after TCP IP rollout because people couldn't just directly use addresses. We use the names, so we divided the DNS to match names to addresses. And congestion control, at the time, we knew there was a congestion problem, but we didn't know how to deal with it. And then when congestion happened, um, there is a fellow named Van Jacobson. For people doing networking, can recognize his name. He uh, developed an effective congestion control. That's what we are still using today. And the routing system, uh, internet started with routing, but uh, when you go large scale, routing became a very different problem. But you know, once you have a problem, there are so many smart people who know how to solve it. But what problem must be solved? That really requires experimentation to identify the real problems. Uh, not only the design, I also, also want to say the implementation actually is a big challenge. Uh, the early design implementations slow, have bugs. Like everyone knows, software implementation always have bugs. But the question is, how many of them? Uh, if you run the software long enough, you basically you know clean up most of the bugs, except those very uh, rare ones. So how TCP IP get rolled out? The key point is the middle one. IP enabled new apps. The new apps that people want, then they, they install the TCP IP. Uh, then they, they interconnect all these uh, TCP IP nodes through the telephone system, actually. They dial up between the IP nodes, and eventually people figured out, hey, we don't have to do that. Why don't we just directly uh, connecting IP nodes using IP protocol? As a matter of fact, uh, that's how eventually the telephone switches went away, you can build IP directly over physical connectivity, like a fiber optics. If you remember one thing from this, this long chat, applications is the single point that can roll out a new architecture. Now, with that, uh, there's a network architecture over 40 years back, 
then we have applications that also drive the technology advances, you know, all this chip industry. So chips get cheaper and faster that enables people to do more applications, uh, do more things. I see network architecture enabled network applications, but then technology also uh, helped applications to grow. Cheaper, faster computers, you can do lots of other things. So what's the new application? We have email, of course. Uh, Telnet FTP, that's the early days of application. But very quickly, in the 90s, we get the web. The web is really get the internet uh, exposed to the general public. Then we have media streaming, conferencing like we do today, smart homes. This is just a few examples. Uh, other things, big data analytics. How does that have anything to do with the networking? Well, how do you get data? So. Networking is really the, the foundation to support all applications. Um, now we have augmented reality so that you can use your phone to see things that's actually not in the physical world. Uh, the question is, uh, the, those applications other than the first bullet about the email, all the other applications did not exist when IP was developed. Now, how come they just uh, came into existence and worked? That really shows that you have the basic building block uh, designed right, then new things that exist before can be supported uh, on this correct design. But uh, it's not just the architecture, network architecture enabled applications and technology helped the applications grow. There's, there's also the backward pressure. Now, there's more applications. They want more from the network. But the TCP IP as a design has not changed yet. So that created the constraints. Uh, also, we should uh, remember that the architecture has a connection with, uh, with, with the technology, uh, right? Like a TCP itself is enabled by computers. So technology advanced, but the network architecture up to this point has not taken any advantages of the more advanced uh, technology. So what do we do today? This is animation got out of order. You know, we do media streaming that we use uh, this thing called the content distribution networks to scale. Uh, we do conference calls that has to go through the cloud. Uh, we do this, uh, this Google, Google team, I think, or something. Uh, we are not communicating directly. My computer is not talking to the computers in Taiwan through internet. Instead, we actually go to the cloud server somewhere and uh, meeting there, rendezvous at that cloud services. Uh, we talk about the smart homes, actually your smart homes supported by the clouds. Uh, if your connectivity to the cloud fails, your, your smart home will stop working, which is very unfortunate. In augmented reality, you think that uh, you are interacting with the nearby physical world, but actually all the communication between you and your nearby uh, objects actually connected through the cloud instead of directly. So I mentioned that if I put two computers, like I currently have two computers on my desktop, do they communicate directly? Uh, not really. How do you communicate directly? One computer has to know the address of the other computer. You have to, to secure the communication channel. Nobody dare to communicate without security. Uh, but we don't really know how to set up security directly between two computers. So again, we communicate through the cloud uh, with, with some exceptions. Like if you have two Apple computers, then they can talk to each other directly. But that's an Apple specially engineered solution. Uh, what do the engineer? They engineer the security so that they can assure the security in the communications. I have this slides here. I mean, the picture about the traffic. I don't know about Taiwan. In LA, traffic is a huge problem. I tell you, just uh, three days ago, I had this problem. Uh, I go into school in the morning, uh, going through uh, this thing called the Beverly Glen. So one morning, the traffic was extremely slow. We don't know what happened. 
But given that it's moving, so I thought I would sit there just to take a longer time to get there. Eventually, we moved to almost the get to Yuxia Wei, and then we noticed that every car had to go back return because there's a uh, water main, the water pipe broke. So therefore, the whole street was blocked. I really wish I knew that uh, before I waited, uh, slowly driving 20 minutes before I hit the returning points. Why can't the cars tell me, the cars in front tell me to say there's actually a road block and I'll turn around right away? The cars can communicate, guys. You should know that all the cars have computers in it. Uh, why can't they communicate it directly? Uh, you think we can use the Google Maps? I did use the Google Maps, but the Google tells me this is the right direction to go. They didn't, I mean, updating Google Maps to reflect the, the real time traffic conditions. Well, I don't know when that's going to happen. It's not happening now. Even in the evening, I look at the Google map, they said, hey, go back the same way to home. I thought after day, if the roadblock is still existing, Google must have learned it. So I went there. But again, roadblock was still there. I had to you know, return back to where I started and pick a different way to get home. Why can't we have all the cars communicated directly. It's the same thing like I mentioned about two computers. We do not have solutions to make the computers communicate directly yet. So we do have security on the today's internet. How we do it? We communicate it through clouds. Uh, we have IP deliver packets. We have TCP guarantee reliable deliver, uh, reliability, but then we secure the TCP connection. Given that we don't know whom, which computer we can communicate directly. So all the computers communicate with the cloud. Uh, creating this picture, I look at this, it's very much like what we, I had back in 1981. There is a big supercomputer and then lots of terminals hanging there. Except that what we are hanging there is not a supercomputer, but rather cloud services. So in that regard, we think the current architecture really needs a change. And we can utilize the existing technology to communicate in a fundamentally different way than TCP IP. Just like IP communicated in a fundamentally different way than the telephone network before it. So what is this a new way? Um, there's a talk actually happened uh, many years back. You can see the 20, uh, 2006 by uh, Van Jacobson. I suggest that people uh, tune into that talk, although that represented the design um, that many years back, and the design had changed in the basic ways. But the talk really gave you this really great idea to say, if you solve the problem by fixing the basics, then uh, it's very difficult to solve. But if you open up to say, you are willing to design a new system to solve the problem uh, in a simpler way, then it really opened your eye to new designs. So what would be a new way to build the systems, build the network the systems? We say that IP just shoot packets to the destination IP address. This new way called the name the data networking, by the name you can tell, it's user names and the user data. That is, instead of shooting packets to destinations, it actually fetch data from the network, exactly from which nodes. That question is not uh, decided by whoever asking data, but rather that question is answered by the network. You just send a request to the network to say, I want uh, data X, Y, Z. And the decision of where the data X, Y, Z uh, resides in the location closest to the requester is determined by the network. So this uh, separated the data being requested, whatever that is, from exactly which location um, the data get fetched. And this is really the desired property of today's applications. And everyone probably look up uh, YouTube uh, for so many great uh, video sources. But if everyone connect to the same YouTube server, 
that would not have worked. Instead, uh, you know, Google specifically built uh, the caches around the globe so that you fetch your desired data from a nearby Google cache. But how that gets done, IP cannot do it. IP only knows specific nodes. So therefore, we engineered all kinds of, uh, I would call it, patches to bridge the gap between what the IP can do, which is shooting packets to an address. This is what IP can do uh, and what the application wants. Application wants to fetch a specific piece of data. In the middle, we do lots of uh, hacks to bridge this big gap. In the end, we say that why don't we do networking directly using the application data name? You just send out a request at the network level to say, here's the data I want. And the network automatically figure out uh, where to fetch that piece of data. So the example could be that you want this uh, YouTube uh, thing, like uh, the man's talk. Otherwise, you want to fetch the Wikipedia data that explain who Van Jacobson is. So this is a very fundamentally different way to do networking. And uh, exactly protocol-wise, what has changed? Uh, in IP, I said the addresses are the most important uh, piece of the IP protocol. You have source address. So destination knows if it has to send a reply, where to send it to. And you have destination address, so the network knows where to deliver it. Uh, in the NDM way, you actually send a request with the application data name. And you leave to the network to figure out where to fetch it. Well, how about the security? What if you fetch the data from the from a bad guy's computer? and then solve that problem by securing the data directly. That is, all the data actually carries a crypto signature so that the data requester can verify whether you actually get the correct data. So if you name the data, you fetch data, that allows you to secure individual data pieces directly. Today, we, we name connections. That is, a TCP connection can be identified by the IP addresses and port numbers. What about data? Well, we, we don't really secure data. We just think that every piece of data coming from a secured TCP connection should be the good data. But that's not a correct assumption. That's how viruses spread. Viruses are spread through uh, secured TCP connections because you are connected to a uh, compromised machine or actually connected to the bad guy's machine. But uh, if the data is assigned directly, the receiving end can really verify whether the data you got is a correct one or is a malicious one. So conceptually, uh, if we compare IP with TCP, uh, with uh, NDN. Conceptually, they're very similar. You know, they all have five layers. Uh, they all have this narrow waist, that is the delivery protocol. Uh, but uh, the way of a delivery, delivery is different. IP push packets, NDN fetch data. And therefore, to answer the questions, uh, IP has these addresses, which you know, you have to match application names to the IP address. Well, in the end, you can see I use the same color to uh, indicate the first three layers. That means they actually use the same namespace. Therefore, you get rid of this translation between names and addresses. So, in the end's answer to the two basic questions is that identifier space is fundamentally different from IP. We just use application data directly. And of course, just as IP, you know, NDN namespace is totally uh, no relation with IP addresses. And therefore, we don't really care about whether uh, NDN packets is delivered through IP or through other means. As long as, you know, some communication media can deliver uh, packets, 
deliver NDN packets, then uh, NDN will be happy about. It's all about the connectivity. So the means of communication uh, is fundamentally different from IP now also. IP is fundamentally different from uh, telephone by decoupling the destination from the specific path. So IP can do dynamic routing. Now NDN actually separated the data being requested from the location to fetch that piece of data. So that gives the network uh, another new degree of freedom to uh, satisfy the end user requirement. I think I'm going slower than expected, even though you people didn't uh, answer questions. I should leave, leave some time for you to ask, ask questions. So if we just use the examples I mentioned earlier about the media streaming at the scale, uh, we don't really need a separate CDNs if you build the application over NDN. Uh, how and why? Because the NDN routers can cache contents, so you don't have, you don't need a specialized cache to do that. Uh, conference at the scale, we can do that because the NDN support multicast delivery. Uh, I'm pretty sure the remote attendees, you are not all sitting in the same room. You're probably in a different locations, and therefore, for my voice, for my uh, uh, slides, everyone needs to get a copy. Uh, and today we do that through the cloud. Um, but in the NDN, the network we actually knows how to multicast the data to each of the desired destinations. Uh, for the smart homes, um, we actually build a prototype of smart home implementation where one control the smart home within the home. Uh, you can store your backup copies or everything into the cloud, but the cloud is merely as a remote resources instead of uh, the controller of your home. So it's uh, you know your home you control. In the augmented reality, we also support localized communication uh, to uh, uh, to really enable that like communications without uh, reliance on the cloud. So uh, if I try to wrap up quickly, I'm asking the same question again. Is it possible at all to change the existing internet? That was a question when the IP came out to say, was it possible at all to change the existing communication network? Uh, IP showed, yes, you can do that. And the way you do that uh, is that uh, you, uh, although NTN currently is an uh, unknown, uh, technology and new development outside of the small community who has been working on NDN over 10 years now. But again, the key point is really new applications that can be built um, on NDN, but very difficult to do over IP. That will drive out the deployment of the new uh, architecture. So rolling out the new architecture, it's not about changing the network infrastructure, but rather it's about IGN. Uh, this concept is not proposed by, by us and the team. There is totally different group of researchers. Uh, they develop the same concept, but they call it limited domains. So there is this uh, uh, ACM paper, whoever interested uh, can, can take a look at that. It's really, we need the application driven uh, development you have useful applications and other people will, will use it. Uh, you really develop applications that don't have good IP-based solutions, for example, smart homes. Uh, you wish to control your home yourself instead of uh, being controlled by the cloud service. So we have such a prototype uh, called the NDN Lite. Uh, there's a published paper Whoever interested uh, can find a copy and see exactly how we get it done. But uh, uh, I wanted to uh, wrap up and go back to the beginning. My question I uh, composed is that, how do we learn the best way to, uh, uh, to design artifacts? 
So here's a quote from Richard Feynman. Uh, Feynman was, was uh, my hero. Uh, I learned a lot about how to do research from reading Feynman lectures on physics. So here he said, what do, do we mean by understanding something? And of course, he's talking about understanding the nature as a physicist. He said that uh, we can imagine that this complicated array of moving things, the physical world, um, is something like a great chess game being played by the gods. And we are observers of the game. We do not know what the rules of the game are. Just like, you know, we do not know how to design the artifact yet. And all we are allowed to do is to watch the playing. Of course, if we watch long enough, we may eventually catch on to a few of the rules. And the rules of the game are what we mean by fundamental physics. Uh, here, we are not watching the god playing the game. Instead, we as experimenters, uh, we actually build the systems. And uh, if we build a few systems and understanding which one or which way it works better than other ways, so we can, uh, if we play long enough and careful enough, uh, we may eventually catch on a few basic rules on how to how best to design the artifact. So uh, going back to a network design as a scientific undertaking, you know, I go back to my physics uh, example again. Networking, like I said, no one built the internet for us, we did it, and there's no Bible tell us how to do it. So we do the same thing, design, implement, experimentation, and we draw lessons. Uh, we go through this cycle, but uh, in a different way. We go through this cycle frequently for incremental improvement. Like a TCP congestion control, people have gone through multiple versions of the design the TCP uh, Reno, TCP Vegas, now the latest is the TCP BBR bottleneck rate control. Uh, but then we also go going through the cycle infrequently, like over a few decades uh, for architectural changes. This is very much in a remote analogy, like how the biological system evolves. Uh, there is this a term, uh, at six o'clock. Created by them called the punctuated equilibrium. That says after major architecture changes, then you uh, continue this uh, incremental improvement. But if the technology has changed big enough, that will demand the next architecture to be rolled out to take advantage of the latest technology and to meet the application requirement in the best way possible. So I would uh, just uh, end up with uh, this uh, uh, slides uh, to say that uh, the fundamental future of networking uh, really relies on recognizing the right communication abstraction. Day one, the first one, you know, is to set up a circuit based on the technology available at the time. And later, we had the computers, we had the internet, uh, we have IP. But now uh, computers are far more advanced uh, with a far more uh, memory space available. And therefore, uh, it's really the time to look, look into the next architectural change. Uh, it's a new uh, uh, interruption. So this new design direction will be focused on fetching named and secure data. For who are interested in exploring more, I, I threw out a few points uh, you can look through. Over the years, we have uh, many tutorials on NDN. There is a protocol specification. There is a stable code base people can download and play with it. We have mailing list for discussions as well. And uh, of course, this is a huge effort uh, has been going on over 12 years now. Uh, started with uh, since uh, 2010, and many people uh, contribute here. In particular, I want to point out uh, NIST, this uh, National Institute of Standard and Technology. They have been hosting the annual community meetings for us. The next one is coming soon. Uh, whoever interested, uh, 
could actually participate online. Of course, there is one thing we cannot change, that is the uh, time zone difference. So time-wise, it may not be uh, very convenient uh, for people in Taiwan, but uh, you could try. Also, uh, needs to record all the community meetings. So whoever interested could uh, look up uh, the recordings of previous years to get a sense of uh, what's going on with the uh, Indian development. So I'll end up here and open up for questions. Thank you, Professor Zhang, for explaining how and from we have what we have today with computers and the internet. And now I'd like to open up the floor for questions and um, discussions. Our audience can use the raise hand function to talk to our speaker today or write down your questions in the chat box and we will relay your questions to Professor Zhang. As our audience is preparing for questions and discussions, Maybe I'd like uh, to pitch the first question. Professor sure. Zhang, do you often have get the question of what's next about technology development? There are two, two kinds of things, right? There's hardware technology that's including both computers and the communications, for example, uh, fiber optics and uh, you know, free space uh, communication, uh, such as the uh, starting. That's a very exciting new technology advances. And then uh, there is a software system development. And of course, everyone knows the hottest topic of the day is AI and machine learning. I'm, that's, that's what I, I see here. I'm very sure it's probably similar in Taiwan. Yes, it's all so, over the world. Mm. Right. Yes. Uh, so therefore, it's, it's very difficult to nail down exactly. Uh, which specific thing is going to happen. But uh, one thing that is a trend we can predict by following Churchill's uh, suggestion, looking back at the past and looking forward to what may happen. That uh, the, um, the one thing we should have the uh, faith in is there's really no feeling for technology advances. <coughs> We cannot say, oh, communication will stop after we reach 10 terabits per second. Or otherwise, computation will stop when we reach the Morse law limitation. Uh, Morse law has you know, stated other physical limitations, but the people these days are inventing different ways to speed up com computation, like uh, the uh, FPGA, like a specialized hardware. Uh, the main specific computing instead of uh, general purpose computing uh, as a way to speed up. So uh, there's so many smart people out there. They find the ways to continue the technology advances, both in terms of software and uh, hardware, actually, both in terms of hardware, in particular in terms of software. Uh, then uh, AI as a, as a really an example. When I started at MIT back in the early 80s, networking was unknown to, to everyone, uh, with the exception of a few. Uh, but the AI was actually a hot topic at the time in the 80s. But then it got cooled down because the technology was not there. Uh, it became hot again, I guess, almost 10 years back when the computation technology has advanced so much so that people, people can afford the neural networks uh, or the large scale data processing, then AI picked up, take advantage of the latest technology advances. I think I saw a question about whether chat GPA is in the end, it's not, right? That's really uh, machine learning uh, to enable like uh, intelligent uh, behavior. It's a very large scale. Will AI speed up the process of punctuating the equilibrium? I don't think I have an answer to that. But the one thing I can say is that uh, the punctuated equilibrium will happen more frequently. Uh, think about the, uh, how long the telephone network lasted, over more than 100 years before IP showed up. Then you think about now IP seems to hit the limit, 
Now we are looking into the next architecture. This is about 50, 60 years at the most. Uh, this is because technology advances uh, is actually at an accelerated speed. There is actually an explanation uh, for that. I think there is a textbook written by Professor Jerry Sauter and others at MIT where it explained the technology acceleration in the following way. It says, take the chip design as an example. Uh, we design the current generation of chips, then we use the current chips to design the next generation of chips. So the new generation of chips is faster than the previous generation, and therefore uh, the speed of the design get you know, speed up. And therefore, the advances really speed up uh, as the technology becomes more advanced. I think that if you want to observe the general trend, uh, so the general trend wise, yes, there's an acceleration of punctuated equilibrium. Um, whether AI has much to do with that, uh, I, I don't think I have an answer to that. But again, you, you can think of AI as really the result of uh, technology advances. Like I said, storage, computing uh, enabled AI. Uh, so AI will accelerate our understanding of the, uh, of the facts and the artifacts. Thank you. Uh, more questions from the audience? Or I'll ask the last question. <laughs> Okay, Professor Zhang, back in the years when the internet was just started, what is the general reaction of the public? Were they excited, scared, or worried? And what would you say about the AI train today uh, in terms of the public uh, reaction? I see, so that's a great question. Um, I can tell you what happened in the early 80s when the uh, IP showed up, uh, the public, didn't know about IP. Uh, like my slide said, it's really the knowledge within a very small technical community. Uh, so public were not aware, therefore, of course, they didn't have any opinions, but uh, within the technical community, however, uh, there's a very strong reaction. You can read that reaction from Paul Barron's paper he published in 77, uh, telling you the reaction from telecom uh, community. Uh, keep in mind, at the time, telephone network was the largest the communication network. So that's a big industry. And um, but there, I had a very strong reaction and thinking that you are doing all wrong with the TCPIP. I heard those uh, objections personally. Uh, the, the people say that uh, you guys don't really know how to build uh, networks. By Stafford, forget it. Uh, you really need the reliability to build the communication systems. Uh, but, and also you need the efficiency. They said, look at the IP, they all have headers. That's a pure overhead. Look at the circuit switch. You know, once your circuit gets set up, everything transmitted across the circuit will use your information, you know, your voice or any other things, no overhead. And I just want to point it out that uh, it is a high overhead the TCPIP eventually won over the world. And that very efficient circuit switch went off the stage. And I do hope people keep this in mind. Evaluating a technology is not about how optimized it is, but rather you should look at what's the new functionality that it can provide that the old ones uh, were not able to, or were not able to do as good a job as a new technology. The, uh, with regarding the public react to AI, on the other hand, this is kind of a different situation because AI is, you know, is publicized uh, uh, results. So everyone knows about it and that the cause uh, the, the society's concern. I, I think the one concern is about whether artificial intelligence eventually actually gonna uh, bypass human intelligence. Uh, 
That's one worry. But there's another worry and a different one. That is, AI now can create artifacts. I mean, not artifacts, like uh, create pictures, videos, uh, information that make a human uh, able to tell the truth from the false. So from that uh, point of view, uh, that there can be a potential greater danger of uh, AI helping the fake news uh, impact. And I think that's that's perhaps the biggest danger as I can see immediately now. Uh, AI bypassing human intelligence. I think for one, there's a still debate on whether that's gonna happen. For two, if that happens, it is sometime in the future, not now. But the, for the fake news uh, created by AI or fake truths, or the false statement created by AI that is with us today. And I want to just add another comment here. Um, there, there is a there is a seminar two days ago about the dual use of technology. Effectively, it talks about how like a bit torrent was a hard research topic ten or fifteen years back, and now bit torrent still work uh, is used not by research community anymore because that became the old news but by people who propagate porn so the concern about dual usage actually is that any new technologies can be used for good purpose can also be used for bad purpose uh, and so is ai and how we mitigate that problem is the challenge facing us today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhang, for answering us uh, with those brilliant um, answers. And thank you for bringing us back to the binary time from which we reflect back and looking at what we have today. Uh, I think I feel appreciated of all the good ideas and hard works that makes the technology advances throughout, through the years. Also, I'd, I like the part when Professor Zhang talked about how did you get the idea and makes it happen? So the answer is think differently when making and which can make new things. So we can make use of the latest technology advances and we shall observe. And soon enough, we will pick up a few rules and make changes. At the, same, at the same time, we should be cautious about its negative impact and move on carefully so we enjoy the advancement and make good use of it. Uh, there are a lot more to talk about, but since we have limited time, we hope we can have more time uh, to talk about this topic maybe in the future, in the next maybe years. So due to the time comes to end, I am going to end today's session and I hope we can soon have another talk with Professor Zhang. Thank you, Professor Zhang, again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I look forward to uh, visiting Taiwan sometime. <laughs>